The uranium market has had an explosive summer, rising from $31 a pound in the futures market to just touching $50 a few weeks ago. It's had a very volatile few weeks, and we'll be discussing its future with our next guest, Mart Wolbert. He is the founder and writer of the Contrarian Codex newsletter focusing on uranium, and he is known as Yellowbow11 on Twitter. Mart, I've been a follower of your work. Great research. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, David. Honor to be here. Honor to have you. Now, Mart, uh, uranium, explosive prices, figurative, figuratively speaking, of course. Is this explosion over? Uh, not even close. I think that we're just getting started. What we've seen, we've seen the uranium spot price rise from, as you alluded to, $31 to approximately a little over 50 so what we've seen now, we've seen it pull back to say 37, 38. And actually in the last few days, it has quote unquote exploded upwards again to 46, 47 pounds or 46, 47 dollars per pound. So what we, what we have seen in that period of time is we have seen Sprott really entering the market and Sprott has um, taken, many people may be familiar with Sprott from their gold and silver trust. They have taken over management of Uranium Participation Corp. And right now they are running it as, a, as their Sprott Fiscal Uranium Trust. When they activated their ATM, which means that they can issue units to raise capital to buy physical uranium and store it, they have really, well, shown the market what they can do. They have, since, the, since they uh, came to the market approximately eight weeks ago, they have scooped up 13.9 million pounds. They now hold around 32 million pounds, which for a little bit of context for all our viewers today, is enough to fuel, theoretically fuel the entire nuclear fleets of both France and Switzerland combined. So what are they, so what are they, they, what are they doing with that? Uh, what are they doing with that inventory? They're just, they're just leaving it there? Yeah, they're holding on to it. They have, they, their intention is to be a close end fund. So that means that they're buying up pounds and they're storing it on site. And they have no, they have reiterated time and again that they have no intention to do anything but sit on it for, uh, the, um, well, the coming years. Or so just, as, just, or just, just reiterate one more time what are the countries that they could fuel with this amount of uranium? Well, right now, France and Switzerland with all their holdings. And since uh, a few days, they bought over 1.5 million pounds more. And that France and Switzerland's calculation was based on the previous amount. So you can probably add another country to that, probably Finland. Okay. So, uh, all right. So let's, what, what, what are we talking about? The supply demand fundamentals and, and uh, I guess how countries might respond to this in just a bit. But uh, let's talk about uh, the uranium uh, price now. Volatile week, as we've seen, went from 50 down to the mid-30s. Now, what, what's, what, what's next? I mean, you're saying the explosion is not over. Do you have, a, do you have an upside target, Mart? I do not have a direct upside target right now. I like to try to take things one step at a time because things can move very, very fast. But what you're seeing right now is with a price sitting at approximately $46 per pound. What we need to reach equilibrium is around 60, 65. That is like the baseline production and production, well, threshold that most people use. But just like with any commodities, especially with one that just came out of a, around a 10 year bear market, we will not, we will likely not stop at equilibrium. It will likely overshoot. And now with Sprott entering the market and a lot of contracts that still need to be signed, it will likely overshoot big. How, how far will it overshoot? Nobody knows, uh, throw a dart right now, but it's, it's certainly shaping up to be a very, very, well, good few years for uranium investors. Do you think that Sprott is going to be the only player, the only asset management firm doing this, taking physical uranium basically off the market, storing it in inventory and making a trust for investors to buy? Well, what we're seeing also is that uh, Yellow Cake PLC, which is a fund out of London, England, is that they are also buying up physical pounds of uranium. We're also seeing other parties interested in buying physical pounds. In recent months, we've seen junior mining companies also buying up 
physical pounds, for example, Dennis and Mines has bought around 2.5 million pounds to store on their balance sheet. So a lot of people are very much interested in uh, buying and storing physical uranium, which is only helping the thesis by widening the supply and demand gap. Right. And Red Sprott is definitely the biggest one. Okay. Is there a supply and demand gap right now? Is the, is the market overall around the world in a deficit or is it in a surplus? It's in a big deficit. It's been in deficit for a few years. What you're seeing right now is that with big financial secondary demand being added, that supply demand deficit is only growing further and further. Mm -hmm. So when you when people ask me, like, why should I invest in uranium? I would argue that uranium has the best fundamental underpinning of any investment asset class in the current market, even after this big run up, because like I mentioned, we're not at equilibrium prices yet. And there is, we still have a long way to go. So yeah, I would argue that uranium, and I have argued that uranium will probably want to be one of the best, if not the best performing investment asset class over the coming, say one or two years from this point onwards. But Mart, uh, like you mentioned, the market has been in a deficit for a number of years. Why hasn't the price run up you know, a few years ago? Why now? Is it just because of spot and other funds entering the market? So we have the secondary investment, uh, investment demand? Or is it? Sorry, I think it's a, I think it's a yeah. combination of a few things. What we've okay. seen after Fukushima is we've seen producers uh, keep on producing uranium, bringing mines into production. And that is what caused the market to be oversupplied. And it took a fair few years to really work through all that oversupply. And But due to things like supply discipline from Chemical by Schilling and Macaulay River Mine, which was one of the biggest uranium mines in the world, Gasatoprom has committed to taking pounds off the market by producing 20% below their subsoil user agreement, which 20% for them is a lot of uranium taken off the market. They have committed to doing this up until 2023. So that is very, very bullish. But what we've seen since the price rise last year was that also due to COVID mine shutdowns, for example, Cigar Lake, which is another major uranium mine in the Athabasca Basin, Basin from Chemical, but also Caselloprom running into trouble with their production. And all around the world, we've seen that happening. We've also seen two uranium mines uh, close, which has taken another few million pounds off the market. So I think a combination of that is finally the price to rise. Okay. So if you zoom out and look at the uranium price chart over a multi, multi-year multi history, you can see that even at today's levels, even at $50 a pound, which is the high that we saw earlier in the month, that is nowhere near its all-time highs back in 2007 of more than $100 a pound. What happened back then, Mart? Why did the price rise to over $100 a pound in 2007? Back then, what you saw is uh, basically like a, a more extreme version of what, what we've seen last year. You saw a big, some big mine floodings also, in, uh, also for Cigar Lake. So the market got scared that supply that was poised to come online and, and produce or produce so that they can fuel this market. Well, it wasn't coming online. It wasn't producing. And that scared the market. A combination of that and also very much financial players entering the market and really having a big impact on uh, on buying physical pounds and, well, basically making sure that the price rose right. a lot, which was eventually stopped by 2008 financial crisis. But that that is what happened. That is what basically caused the spike last time. Could, could this happen again this time? I would not bet against it, especially not with Sprott. Uh, as we've seen, Sprott has had a profound impact right now, and they are actually in the process of uh, searching out a New York Stock Exchange listing. Let's say that will happen if it happens in Q1 of next year, maybe right. Q2, it depends how fast it goes. But that will give big financial players and people that really want to play this uranium bull market, but can't play it right now because the sector is still relatively small for for some context, the total publicly traded market cap of all uranium equities right now is $40.2 billion at the time of recording, which is tiny compared to some of the other stocks that you see, right. especially the big ones. And it, this is for an entire sector. So 
if Sprott gets that New York Stock Exchange listing, they will have a very liquid vehicle that will give big financial players the option to play this uranium bull market. And uh, I think they will grab that option with both hands with uh, a lot of uh, response with equity pricing that will likely follow that. Let me just ask you this, Mart. Uh, I know nobody knows the upside target. Nobody has a crystal ball. But if I were to make a bet with you, I'd say, I'll bet you $100 that uh, the price of uranium is going to breach new all-time highs past its 2007 peak sometime in the next five years. Would you take that bet or would you bet against me? I think I, uh, when we're, what we're seeing right now, I think I would take that bet. I you think, take, uh, okay. yeah, I think, I think it may. But if you're wrong, if you're wrong, if you're wrong, it doesn't reach a hundred dollars. First of all, you owe me a hundred dollars and you owe me a bunch of beers. Okay. That's the bet. So, <laughs> you still good, take that bet? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Fair enough. Let's talk about the term market. This is a very important market. You were telling me offline. Tell us about the contracts that are expiring and what that means for the price. So what we're seeing right now is um, I, will, I will start by giving some context for the viewers of the last bull market. What we, what we have seen was that utilities contracted most or signed most of their long-term contracts near the peak of the last cycle, which was 2006, 2007, 2008, that time period where they were signing contracts at approximately 120 to 130%, sometimes even more of their annual demand. That dropped off big after the Fukushima disaster because after 2012 onwards in these last past nine to 10 years, we have seen utilities contracting at an approximate rate of say 32% of their annual demand. We are seeing a lot of contracts that are poised to, um, to run off in the next five years with a lot running off in 2026. These things take a long time to negotiate and they want to be covered so when we when they want to be covered probably by 2024. So what you are seeing is that they are now slowly coming back to the term market. They're testing the waters. And when the first few contacts are signs, I think things could move very, very quickly. So in the years ahead, we're seeing that utilities are wanting to be covered in the years ahead. And especially now with less and less mobile supply available, uh, these long-term contracts are their best bet in getting that security of supply. What, what price do you think they will renegotiate these contracts at? Do you have an idea? I think that right now, you're, of course, the first few contracts will be signed at lower prices, say a four or five handle. We're already seeing contracts being signed in the four handle, but most contracts will be signed higher than that. I think that the average contracting price in the last bull market was around $70, $75, maybe yeah. a bit less, a bit more than that. I don't know if the exact number is with me right now. But I think that uh, the price that most contracts will be signed this cycle once more will be with a six, a seven, or an eight handle at least. And just and just to give an idea to the, to the audience, I mean, the, the uranium market is not just a spot price. There are several prices that constitute the uranium market. Right? Tell us about these different prices that are important to follow. So what you're seeing is in the uranium market, you have three different segments. Basically, you have the price of U3U8, you have the price of enrichment, and your price of the conversion. But the price in the, the past few bull markets, we've had around three bull markets in uranium, with the best known, of course, being the one that ended in 2007, 2008. And what you're seeing in each and every single time is that the price of conversion, the price of enrichment, when they go up, the price of U3U8 always follows. In the years, in a past few years, we have seen um, demand for conversion enrichment increase. We've seen their prices increase, and we have never had a disconnected price increase across the board. So U308 is just following that trend right now. And uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's so we've never seen this disconnect before. before. Excuse me? We've never seen this disconnect before. We've never seen a disconnect in price when uh, the price of enrichment and conversion have gone up U308 as Thus yeah. far, always followed. Okay, and and w what do you think that means for the market? I think that means that uh, we are poised for a very good one to two years for the prices of uh, of All uranium. Right. All right, let me let me ask you about uh, supply in North America. So, as as we know, there's very little to zero production going on right now in North America. For first of all, at what price do you think uranium needs to be before? the production in North America resumes? I think at the very least we need uh, $50, $55, but that is 
basically a break-even price yeah. and that's not even for all of the potential producers. I think that we're looking at $60, $65 at least before we see a bigger ramp up of uh, production in the United States. And what you see after a 10-year bear market, these companies want to make a good return on investment. They want to regain all that capex that they've spent. They want to make sure that they can really, really get the most out of this bull market. So it might yes. be even higher than that before you see a big res supply response. But the general consensus is that it will be approximately 60 65 and, and yeah, as a uranium investor, I might ask, well, there's uranium production, obviously, in other places around the world. So why are other companies producing uranium at current prices and not North American companies? Give us an example. Because, because other co a lot of other companies, well, a lot of other companies, a few other companies are able to produce uranium at uh, cheaper than the, let's say, the $50, $60 threshold which is uh, the biggest one is, of course, Casadoprom, which is yeah. by far the biggest producer in the world. They are able to produce at lower cost, sub $30. Um, how? There more, how? How are they? They're yeah, using, how? Uh, there, there, are a few, there are several reasons for that. There are also reasons to do with their currency, but mostly like they're using the ISR mining method, in situ recovery mining. This is also the case in the United States, but in Kazakhstan, the overall costs are far lower. And it, what, it, what you basically do is you pump a liquid acid solution into the ground and you pump up the uranium with it at a much lower cost than traditional mining in Kazakhstan. In Uzbekistan, they're also producing uranium. And these, uh, these countries, they can produce at a far lower cost and they're doing that. And they're also signing contracts at a lower cost. Well, if I were a shareholder of, let's say, Cameco, I might go to a shareholders meeting and say, well, look, I'm not a, I'm not a geophysicist, I'm not an engineer, I don't know anything about uh, a mining, but I might ask the board, well, look at what the uh, companies in Kazakhstan are doing. Why can't you do the same thing and increase your margins? Well, because in the case of Cameco, they have, uh, they have shut down Macarthur River a few years ago, and if they want to bring that back, they're not looking to bring it back right now, but if they want to bring that back, that's going to take... 12 to 24 months before it's back right. to proper But I'm wondering production. why can't why can't they use the same mining methods as the 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 companies in Kazakhstan for example Well ISR has never been used in the Athabasca basin it's an unproven method and well Dennis another company in the Athabasca basin Dennis Mines is trying to implement that into their uh, Wheeler River project specifically yeah. their Phoenix deposit but it has never been used in the Athabasca basin and us does also not for Cigar Lake and Macaw River. So tell us about some mining companies, maybe one or two that you do like and why you picked those companies. I would say that the company that I mentioned, Denison Mines, uh, I very much like because they have a very high grade uh, development project, the Squealer River. It consists of Phoenix and Griffin. And that high grade deposit they are currently developing, and they are trying to implement the ISR mining method there. It's a risky proposition, but uh, with potential very high reward. They also have a very big land package of around 188,000 hectares, which in the FM Basket Basin gives them a lot of upside potential when it comes to really trying to explore for new deposits. And they also hold a stake in several deposits as well. And another one that I really like is Global Atomic. This is a company that has an asset in Niger. They also have a sink mine, which means that in uh, Turkey, which means that they have some cash flow, which reduces dilution, which may otherwise have hit current shareholders. Mm -hmm. But uh, they hold a very big deposit at relatively low oil and sustaining costs per pound. So, and they're trying to trying their best to bring it into production as fast as they can. Okay. Generally speaking, how should somebody, an investor, pick a uranium stock? What are some of the top three things, for example, top two or three things that you look for in a uranium company? I would say that the three things that you want to look for in pretty much any junior exploration company or development company, but especially in uranium, is you first of all want to look at the management. You want to have an experienced management team that is aligned with shareholders. You want a management team that has done it before. You don't want a management team that has explored for oil in Australia, for example, or gold in Australia, and is now looking for uranium or trying to develop a uranium deposit in the Athabasca Basin. You want an experienced management team that has experience in, with the task at hand. 
we also want them to have a stake in the company because if you want to win, they should win more if they have a big stake and that gives them extra incentive. The second one is looking at the quality of their assets. For an export, that will be what land packs do they have? How big is it? Is it near or at historical sites where uranium has been produced? Or is it at a site where potential hybrid uranium can be found? For example, in the Afro-Basket Basin, there are a bunch of explorers that have very promising land packages. And other than that, if you have development assets, you want to look at what grade do you have? How many millions of pounds do you have? How easy it is to bring into production? Where is it located? And the last one is the plan that they have. Are they cashed up? Do they need to dilute? Are they doing, are they doing what they're saying? That, that they're doing. If a company says, all right, we're going to explore and that's why we're raising five or seven and a half or $10 million. And in the end, they only put a few drills down nowhere near the amount of uh, capital that they raised. Yeah. That's a pretty big red flag. So you want to see that they hold on to their plans. And, and, and let's talk about the global demand profile for uranium going forward. Nuclear power is growing all around the world, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And that's pretty much contrary to popular belief. A lot of people still think that nuclear power is a dying industry, but it's no, nowhere close to that. Recent numbers, and those are very conservative numbers in, uh, in my opinion, have uranium or have nuclear power as a growth industry at approximately 2.6% all the way through to 2040. And that growth is coming mostly out of Asia, so a bit of, out of Africa as well. So yeah, nuclear power is growing, demand for uranium is going, and especially given like the current focus that we have on reaching carbon neutral goals, nuclear power has to be an integral part of that. Nuclear power is so much more reliable than say wind or solar at 93.5% capacity when you have wind and solar, which are way, way lower than that. So yeah, with the renewed focus, focus on nuclear power, that 2.6% is poised to uh, be a lot larger in the years ahead. And, and uh, let's just talk about uh, geographical breakdowns. You mentioned most of the growth is coming from Asia and, and Africa. We're gonna pull up a map here. For, this is from your recent report. The data is from the WNA. And just tell us about uh, this map. What are we looking at? Why is most of the growth happening in the East? Well, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing China really, uh, really putting a lot of resource into developing new nuclear reactors. They are doing it very efficiently. They're building it on time and on budget. And they want to really, they want to add a lot of gigawatts of capacity to their current grid. What you also see is you see India committing a lot of capital to nuclear power. And you, what you also see is you see a country that, well, was hit by the Fukushima disaster, Japan, which a lot of people think that they're trying to phase out nuclear power. And yes, they have shut down some nuclear power plants, but they're currently trying to bring some of them back in name of well, energy security right now with the energy crisis that we're seeing. And, but also in the name of just trying to reach carbon neutral goals. So yeah, they're trying to bring reactors back. They're looking to do that right now. And also different countries in Asia, Korea is looking to do the same. Okay. So yeah, the proposition is um, only getting better and better right now. Okay. And uh, all right, so we'll be watching out for demand growth in all corners of the world. Finally, Mart, tell us about yourself. Like, uh, you know, you're, 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 you, don't, you don't look like you've been around the industry for decades. So obviously, you're, uh, you, you gather the, your wealth of knowledge through your own research, you told me offline. How did you become involved in doing research for uranium? Well, uh, I, um, some time ago, I ran into a video by Cameco that talked about this commodity that will fuel a greener, uh, like a greener world via nuclear power. I got really interested in it. At first, it was only a smaller, relatively small part of my portfolio. But the more I researched it, the more I found out that nothing was quite as interesting as reading about nuclear power and uranium, but also the sheer fundamental underpinning was absolutely amazing. So I did more and more research on it. I wrote a, an 18 page piece on it. I started sharing that on Reddit and also on Twitter. It got a lot of traction and I'm very happy to say that a lot of people are, uh, I still receive messages almost every day that people are very thankful that they got in early and I'm very happy to see that. Yeah. And right now I am uh, spending most of my time doing interviews. Well, usually I'm on the other side of the table. So that's right. 
I do interviews with uh, industry insiders, with uh, CEOs of companies, and I also do write-ups, company analysis, and basically all the research that you would need for uh, to make the most out of this uranium bull market at my own uh, newsletter service, which is the Contrarian Codex. Okay. And where can people find out more about your work? Well, people can find my write-ups. I, do, I write a bi-weekly newsletter. I do company analysis. I do interviews where I'm usually at the other side of the table. And they can find all this at my newsletter, which is the Contrarian Codex. And that is where I try to help people make the very most out of this uranium bull market. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you so much for coming to the show, Martin. And uh, we'll have you back on again to follow up on the uranium market. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lin. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.